welcome to day two of getting it right. Um, we never know whether people would come back to the Congress after day one, but it's really great to see everyone here again. So thank you for um, joining us and of course, uh, spending your morning with us. A lot of things happened yesterday and it's not even my, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm not even sure whether it's a real job of me or not to do this day one summary. The thing is, nobody really sent me anything. I mean, people who share the sessions, uh, including all the plenary, except one. So we would, uh, we would spend a bit of time on that. But um, indeed, the whole opportunity, the opportunity to, to get together before the plenary starts is to, um, you know, do a little bit of thinking about what we are, have been, what, what we set ourselves to do and what we wanted to achieve. We have two more days, right? So today is going to be um, very important by the show of hands. People are coming from different places, maybe representing different groups. So who do we have here? We have people representing um, organizations like community organizations, fish harvesters, uh, fisher groups. We have that in the room. Yeah, that's uh, okay. So we have, I know we have a FFAW here. We have, uh, we met Sonia yesterday from uh, Skipper Otto. Who else do we have there? Okay, we're gonna have to repeat that again. I forgot one minor thing, which is what Isaac is gonna do, unless you speak to the microphone, nobody over there. Uh, our, our colleagues are virtual online, would not be able to hear. Let's see, say that again, please. So we're from the Chippewas of Nawash and Nawashingnaming, Ontario. Uh, we're a fishing community um, for time and memorial. So uh, we're here and it's been, very interesting to sit and see that everybody sort of has the same issues, you know, from if you're in a fishing community, that just seems to be the way it falls. Thank you. Uh, Babisha, could you grab that other microphone? Because we have uh, colleagues uh, uh, on this side of the room who is actually in, uh, would introduce as well. Yeah, back there. Thank you. Anin, hello. Hi. My name is Greg Aiko. I'm from uh, the Sault Ste. Marie area in Ontario. I fish on Lake Superior. I'm a commercial fisherman myself. And we fished since, I remember, since I started a time, I guess. But it's been a long time. We had to fight for our rights up there when the government tried to take them away from us. Wouldn't let us fish. But we beat them now. The only ones fishing on our area, Lake Superior, is our people. So that worked pretty good. Now we got to fight them for the rest of the promises that they had made to us and then when we made a treaty agreement with them. Uh -huh, miigwech, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you see that we actually are able to capture Greg on the screen. So if you wanted to be shown on the screen, you're going to have to try to do that, right? Face the camera. So, okay, unless you want just uh, to see the back, then, uh, okay, we have one more person here. Go ahead, please. Go, and, and like I said, if you like to be seen, just uh, face the camera a little bit or, you know, keep turning around. I, I don't want to break the camera, so I'll, I'll turn the other way. <laughs> I'm Peter Halme from San Diego, California. I'm a fisherman, or fishers as you call them here. Uh, I'd like to know how many fishermen, I mean, actually fishermen who fish are at this conference or in this room today. Okay. Could, could we have them stand up or something so I can get an idea? Because I'll be honest with you, there's not very many ever at these functions. So, well, so. let's stand up if you are an active fishing person. Thank you. Okay. There you go. And I tell you, if you want to, you know, these will be more than any conferences you ever go to. 
<laughs> no, uh, you know, to talk about small scale fisheries. So organizations, are there like uh, environmental organization, community groups, in addition to Skipper Otto and, yeah? Okay, ah, Oceana, can we get a microphone you like to introduce? Well, hi everyone, uh, Bob Rangeley, uh, Director of Science, Oceana Canada, and we're based in Halifax. And I have Jack Daly with me and Jillian Conrad somewhere here. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Um, and then, and then, of course, you know, it's always like that, right? Because conference is where uh, researchers, academics, and um, you know, people who are interested in doing different type of research go. So I assume that. And then government. Maybe we should do that first. We have uh, people working in governments in this room. Yes. Ooh, look at that. Excellent. Okay. And we know um, we met Jen yesterday and uh, learned a lot about how DFO goes about things. Anyone wants to introduce yourself from the government perspective? Or are you trying to try not to let people know who you are? <laughs> okay. So we then have the rest. Can we assume then that you are from kind of a researcher institution universities? Okay, how many people from US and Canada? Let's say US. Okay, that's pretty good. Canada. Oh, Canada West Coast. Yes, well, I kind of from UBC at some stage. Canada East Coast. Okay, what, what about the other coast of Canada? Okay, well, we have <laughs> the other coast, like outside of Canada, we have that too, right? People from outside of Canada and the US. There you go. Very good. What a diverse group. And okay. Uh, I'm neither from Canada or the United States. We, <laughs> we, we have our own, uh, <clears throat> our own Dibway territory where I come yeah. from. Yeah. I don't consider myself a Canadian or an American. I, can't, I consider myself yeah. a yeah. native or a, of, a, of my own territory, Miigwech. Yeah, I think we should all be like that. We just have this, you know, kind of a, a whatever, whatever works, right? It's a self, part of that self-identification. So I'm totally into that. I'm a mix of many things myself, um, growing up in one place, living in others, loving you know other stuff from uh, what the world has to offer so i think this is exactly what we're doing here right it's about being uh, you know recognizing all the diversity and being inclusive in our process so i think we all doing a great job thank you again for for being here and for being part of this uh, important conversation okay let me have my slide back and i will see with uh, you know we can uh, get this moving along so um, the second, uh, let's, uh, let me see. Okay, excellent. So I am um, showing this simply because it was the only thing I was sent. And this, <laughs> as you saw yesterday, we have people putting things in whatever it's called, jam board. Now I'm learning new word here. And uh, you know, you get that. But if you are like me, you get this. I'm just like, what, what, what is it? What do you want to get right again? Adaptation, of course. Oh, yeah, but everything's connected, isn't it? The system, the embeddedness, and so on and so forth. And then I really got, really was kind of taken by, by this comment about uh, small scale fisheries getting too big. And then we have another person said, they're getting too small. And I'm just like, what is it? Right. But then there were a lot of things about, you know, what is this about or what is not about. It's not about the money, but there are many other things. And a lot of people do recognize that for sure. But then, you know, even though we were talking about getting adaptation right or getting small right, but it was so obvious that a lot of this is also about getting governance right, which is what we're going to be focusing on today. So people, we are, you know, presenting different ideas, regional governance, community-centered governance, participatory participatory governance, for instance. But then the big question is still there, right? But who should be in charge of what exactly? So I think that is a kind of conversation that would continue today. 
And we also have before that getting the conservation right as well. But really, I'm not trying to do a summary. As you can see, this is an easy opt out for me, right? Instead of me trying to say, or you know, groups that are sending information to, to me, why don't we share that? What, what did you hear yesterday that you want to, that really caught your attention and that you really feel like that was good? And what, and there's another question that you can have if you don't like to talk about what you heard that you like, you can answer the other question, which is what you would have liked to hear more and you haven't. Okay, it's your turn. What did you hear yesterday that you felt that that's a key message? Over there, Pratip, go ahead, please. Uh, I think you know uh, what is important to me is what I didn't hear. I would uh, have loved to hear, and I would like to hear in uh, the rest of the two days. Uh, there was a lot of discussion around uh, small-scale fisheries. Uh, uh, you know, what do you say? <laughs> the um, readjust. You know, what do you, what's the theme? <laughs> Getting it right. Sorry, you know, early morning. <laughs> it's only day night. two, but uh... <laughs> yeah, early morning, late night beers. You know, so the com bad combination. Okay, uh, so uh, you know. When we talk about small scale fisheries, you know, getting small scale fisheries from many perspectives, and I'm thinking of the communities that I work on the east coast of India, you know, if you say getting small scale fisheries on that coast right, that means, you know, you're almost saying that there is something wrong with them. Uh, therefore, they need to be right. And this is almost uh, something that is used by other groups to. Uh, to brand them as wrong and uh, therefore say, you need to get right and we are right already. So I think you know, that needs to, that, that the theme needs to change a little bit into saying, you know, small scale fisheries can only get right if everything that are connected to small scale fisheries also get you know, right. Yeah. And we need to kind of you know, hammer there more yeah. than small scale fisheries itself. You know? so, you know, yeah. a bit of a narrative change uh, and, yeah. the, and the language that was, uh, you know, yeah. uh, emphasized in one of the, you know, keynotes uh, yesterday yeah. uh, uh, is, is something that I would like to, you know, yeah. uh, engage and listen and hear more. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, that's exactly why we never say getting small scale fisheries right. It is about getting adaptation right for small scale fisheries sustainability, for instance, getting um, small right is important too, but that's about making connection to get small right. So I think we are on that same page, but it would be good to make sure, right, that, you know, there are many things today, for instance, about getting governance right, right? It's getting governance right for, to help support viable and sustainable small scale fisheries. Thank you. What other key messages that, that you heard yesterday that you'd like to share? And I'm inviting our audience from online as well. Charles, microphone, the, the microphone people, this is your time for exercise. Hi, um, my name is Charles Levko. I'm from uh, Anishinaabek Territory, north, uh, uh, just on the North Shore of Lake Superior, Lake at University. Um, I guess one of the things I heard that was really interesting, I think it was Sonia, in the presentation, you started off, you had those numbers about how much is being imported and how much is being exported. And you made a comment that has been sitting with me around kind of that history of extraction and colonialism and the way that, you know, even Canada was settled, right? And, and how much is being exported and the idea that some of these community-based local options are really, like really kind of challenging that. I thought that was really interesting. The one thing I haven't heard a lot about, which I'd like to hear more, I think is important, it's been raised a few times by some of the folks here, is that when we think about fisheries, I think we can't do that without talking about the history of colonialism, the ongoing settler colonialism, the genocide that's been happening around Indigenous people, the extraction of the resort, the land, the fish, but also the taking away of land. And um, I think that's a really important, so those questions of power and equity, 
um, and privilege that go on and continue to go on with a lot of the discussions and uh, the histories of, of an ongoing yeah, of, fish, of fisheries in, in this in both in this continent. So, so that's a really important issue, and I'd love to hear more about that in some of the conversations here. Thank you. Okay, very important conversation that we can continue to have. There's a lot of issues with power equity, and you know, from our perspective, it's also about justice. So, therefore, we need to uh, emphasize that. Okay. Yeah. Few. Yeah. Okay, Peter. Go ahead, please. Uh, we heard a lot of talk yesterday about the graying of the fleet and that we need new people coming into the fishery. On the other hand, we heard how miserable it is, how terrible it is, how you're not making money. That's not a very good way to attract new people into the fishery. And we haven't heard enough about success stories, things that are going well. Success stories. That's a good one. It's not uh, nothing really wrong with small scale fisheries. They actually are can be lucrative and they actually are well organized in many places and actually perhaps are empowered to do many things. So let's hear more of those success stories. And, uh, and Peter, of course, would be our plenary speaker this afternoon. So I'm sure you can share that story later with us. Um, don't save it for tomorrow, huh? Because we might not do this again. So if you want to say anything now, this is your chance. Otherwise, we're gonna move um, in a little while to, okay, go ahead, great. So uh, I wasn't here yesterday. Ah, so. <laughs> so what are you gonna be talking about? <laughs> but, I, but I did wanna just say uh, and acknowledge that today is National Indigenous Peoples Day, um, but more significantly, it's summer solstice. So yes. this is like a very, like it's a market point of like our journey because yes. everything that we do goes in cycles, um, including like trips around the, around the sun. And um, these conversations are things that have been happening for, well, in my working career anyway, and I'm sure they're gonna continue on, but it's just good to hear that people are bringing up issues that you wouldn't necessarily see in the mainstream media. I just wanna know, acknowledge that. Okay, thank you very much. Indeed, there will be a special treat uh, to, to help celebrate the National Indigenous uh, People's Day, which I will talk about in a little while. Okay, go ahead, please. Ani Boju, Nick Indigenous Kaz, Makwaidawadam. I'm from Neoshingaming, Ontario. One of the things that I thought was uh, good yesterday was. The, all the talks that we're starting to have, one of the big ingredients that we're missing out of all of this is the indigenous knowledge and the lack of respect for the water and the lack of respect for the animals. The animals, we don't manage the animals. They manage themselves. Mother nature manages them. That water is like the, like the blood that goes through our veins. It's what nourishes our body. It's what nourishes Mother Earth, nourishes the animals and the plant life. I, I want to say, you know, Chi Ming Wish for being able to stand up and be able to talk about this because there, the things that we've seen yesterday, we're only looking at it in a three dimensional sense. But if you take one of those things out, it's not balanced. In all of our teachings and all of our medicine wheels, it's in force. And we're not going to get right if we don't start to look at this in a holistic approach, using the balance of that medicine wheel and those teachings that have been passed down through generations from our ancestors and from the people that have fought for us to be able to carry this way of life. That includes, you know, working with the Ministry of Natural Resources as much as they don't like to listen, including working with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, even though they think that their word is gospel and that they don't want to work with First Nations. I, I strongly suggest that we, you know, we all pause for a moment here and recognize all of creation 
recognize that this is the summer solstice. This is the longest day yeah. of the year and recognize all those people that have come before us. The, you know, never even may, may not have brought it, may not have made it home from the wars or from residential schools or from other such places. Um, you know, there's a long atrocity in Canada of genocide and not listening to First Nations people. And I would have expected to hear something more today at a conference of this level and magnitude mm -hmm. to recognize First Nations people and, and the extraordinary work that they have done for Canada, mm -hmm. including the War of 1812, including the World War One and World War II where a lot of our members, um, you know, fought, voluntarily fought to defend freedom in this country and were not recognized when they came back. Thank Miigwech. you. Thank you for sharing that. Maybe this is a good... Uh... Can I get... It stop working. Can I get next slide? Right, maybe this is a good segue to move into this because we do have, like I said, um, a, a little treat. I know some, I don't know whether you, some people, actually there was a sunrise ceremony since this morning to, to celebrate um, the National Ind Indigenous Peoples Day. And there's a lot of activities uh, throughout the day as well. From our, from our um, we hope this is a, you know, a, a good contribution to help with the celebration. Um, I didn't even think that we were planning that way. To me, it's a summer solstice for sure. I recognize that. And I always, you know, do something special on June 21st. And uh, we do have this great opportunity to do that here as part of this Congress. I would invite uh, in a little while, um, uh, Christine and uh, maybe Charles, if you like to just say a few words uh, about, about what, what you're going to be seeing. And then there will be... Uh, a trailer as well. Um, sure. So I'm uh, Kristen Lowe, and I'm here from um, the traditional territory of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee in eastern Ontario. Um, I'm a settler uh, academic at Queen's University. So you probably, hopefully, saw the postcards on your tables. So there is a screening tonight um, at 8:30. Buses leave at 7:30 of uh, a film that myself and my colleague. Um, have been working on in partnership with Batchawana First Nation. Um, Greg Agua, who you met uh, as an elder and counselor from Batchawana, who's also in the film. Um, and so this film shares uh, stories of elders, youth, fishers, knowledge keepers uh, from Batchawana First Nation, really about the, their visions about the future of their fisheries on the eastern shore of uh, Lake Superior and their efforts and sort of struggles to uh, exert sort of self-determination uh, of their fisheries. Okay. So there okay. will be uh, there will be buses leaving the Delta at seven thirty. So uh, to go to Bruno Center on St John's Memorial uh, University St John's campus. So if you'd like to join the movie, get uh, get yourself on the bus. There'll be two buses leaving maybe ten minutes from each other, and then you can come first to the third floor uh, of a uh, lab. We would have uh, a little pizza and. Uh, you know, refreshment, and then you can have that and socialize a little bit. And then we go and uh, see the movie together. So it's all in that same building. So if you like to join us, that would be a good opportunity to learn more and also to, uh, you know, have good discussion with our, our producers and filmmaker here and also uh, people in the movie. We do have a trailer, so why don't we show that? In the meantime, Evan, do you have any questions from Zoom? We're just trying to get this out. Yes. Um, Rachel Morrison uh, said, one message I heard many times is that fisher, fisher people, uh, the population of fisher people are, is aging and many retiring from the industry. So the graying of the industry theme again, which is resulting in labor loss and worsening food security. She says this is coupled with less young people coming into the industry. And what she's wondering is if there are initiatives from the various people who talked on yesterday's panel and perhaps on upcoming panels 
that are providing outreach and trying to involve youth in small scale fisheries in a positive light. This is something that she would love to hear more about from, from everybody over this, these days. Thank you. All right, thank you. So that kind of uh, reflects what we heard it earlier. So thank you for that, Rachel. Okay, are we ready? Good. I never can go down a lake it's with my grandfather. I've been about 11 or 12 years old. My dad, he fished from Brocap all the way up to Otter Head. My dad fished. This small thing, this area was a, just like a mega area for people to come in and trade and fish for goods. A lot of our people still live that way. A lot of our people are still traditional. For my vessel, it's called uh, the Gordon on J. It's named after my parents, Gordon and Don. They were instrumental in pursuing our tree rate to fish. They approached me and they wanted to look into the fish logs and tell me how to cover up the fish with a tarp. And this is a treaty license that we're fishing. I, I hate using the word license because. A license can be taken away. It's an inherited right, and they can't take an inherited right from us. I'll never, never get a license because I have to treat the boat and trash that I can fish without a license as long as the green grass grows and the water flows. There are movements on the part of Canada right now that will reduce our nation to nation relationship. Canadian law changes depending on who's in government. Our law doesn't change, it's, it's always the same. Natural law doesn't change, whether it's a conservative government or a liberal government. What's law today may not be law tomorrow. And if we put ourselves under that constitution, we're jeopardizing our inherited obligations and inherent rights. I said, according to the Indian Act, I'm supposed to exercise my right where my ancestors began. And it began here, and I will be. You want to charge me with fishing, I will be. You're going to look damn stupid in front of a court. You're charging Mr. Egg with fishing and Egg will be where his ancestors began. It's a right. It's not a privilege. It's our right. And it's, it's something that we take very serious. And with the right comes responsibility. Instead of working together, they're hoping that they can say, well, look at you know, those Indians couldn't do it, so we got to go look at it. Okay, thank you. So, premier screening tonight. Uh, bus leaves at 7.30, so join us. Um, okay, so get the slide back, because we're going to queue the next session. Right, so we are right on time for this next uh, session. So I would like to um, invite, oops, not there yet, oops. <laughs> okay, okay, here, here we are. I would like to invite uh, Patricia, well, it's Patricia and Evan who are running these sessions together. One would be here to see you and then one would be as your Zoom host. So Patricia, go ahead, the floor is yours. Are they here? I'll use this one. I'd love to have them join me on the stage. Thank you. Welcome. And we are working on getting Trish online. Um, thanks for the introduction. My name is Patricia Pinto da Silva, and uh, I'm here from NOAA Fisheries. That's the US government fisheries agency at the federal level. And I work in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where I'm a social scientist. I'm part of a group of about 17 economists and non-economists in our region. And 
nationwide, we have about 70 economists and about 10 social scientists all thinking about the human dimensions of fishing. So definitely not enough for such a large country, but uh, we, we are trying to get it right. Um, I wanted to first thank uh, the organizers and um, uh, Ratana and Vesna and you know everyone who's helped bring this together and especially Evan, who's actually brought our speakers together and helped do the heavy lifting to, to set this up. Um, and I really wanted to thank the presenters because I know it does take a lot of time to prepare for these things. You know, sometimes these talks are 10, 15 minutes, but people put a lot of thought and attention into them. So I wanted to thank them in advance. Um, Evan's gonna be manning the online portion of this and um, uh, I will be helping with moderating the folks on the stage. Trish Clay, Dr. Trish Clay will be coming in on Zoom as soon as we get her set up. Um, but we will go ahead and, uh, and, and get going to keep on the time schedule. So we're at step zero for getting marine conservation right. Uh, and this plenary presents different perspectives about marine conservation in Canada, the United States and across the Atlantic. Um, and thinking about research and policy opportunities to build capacity for inclusive marine conservation. We're gonna be talking about you know, different perspectives, visions and values related to marine and ocean conservation, um, thinking about priorities and concerns as well as different visions for the oceans. And we have a really interesting group, I think. Um, I wouldn't say it's diverse in some ways and not diverse in other ways, but it does, bring some different perspectives amongst academic disciplines, as well as having um, Erica join us with her experience on the water and also in, um, in, the, in the field of science as well. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of, uh, of us talking about the strengths of small scale producers and what they offer and how that's different from other scales of fishing how they connect us to, this, to seafood in different and unique ways and how they're connected to the communities that they're embedded in. And for years, we've talked about culture, connection, local ecological knowledge, community co-management co and self-governance. And the shift I see now is around resilience, adaptation, innovation, creativity, um, and diversity and inclusion in a lot of what we do um, and going beyond the community to think about the local, regional and global food systems. Um, we're gonna start with Erica Porter and uh, she will have about 20 minutes to, to tell us um, a bit about her experiences. And then each of the other speakers is gonna talk for about 10 minutes. And I think there's a choice point there um, where I might actually just go out to the audience and start getting audience participation and questions. So start thinking about the questions that you may have for the speakers. I do have a couple of questions that I'd like to send their way if there is time, but I really want to prioritize making sure that the questions in the room are asked and the ones that are coming in online. Um, and just a quick introduction for Erica. She's a small scale fisher. Um, and science tech in Nova Scotia. She began commercial fishing 10 years ago at the age of 16 with her father, starting off Gasparo fishing in the Avon River, then operating a tidal weir in the Minas Basin. Her work has transitioned into primarily science-based research. Erica loves to share her knowledge and show that the river is not just muddy water, but a network of life, breaking down the barrier between people and the sea. Thanks so much for coming, and we really, uh, you know, appreciate your you being here. Um, I do first want to say that thank you for having me here, and it's so um, encouraging to feel all the love in this room through talking to people. Um, I am a little bit nervous. <laughs> I don't do this quite often, but, um, okay. Okay, so like I said, I am a little bit nervous. Um, this is honestly my first kind of big speaking thing like this. And I never thought I would even do this in my lifetime. I always said like, I just wanna do the work. I just want to fish, catch, you know, catch things, measure them, none of this public speaking stuff. But I have realized that with 
I have realized that the hands-on work isn't the only way to make a change and networking and bringing awareness like we're doing here today is just another piece of the puzzle. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, I live in a little community in the inner bay of Fundy, the highest tides in the world, rising and falling over 50 feet in just hours. With such high tides create a high turbidity, and this means the silt has little chance to settle, creating brown water and muddy flats, which make it hard to see the, and appreciate the life underwater. I live in, a, oh, well, <laughs> the general phrase in the surrounding communities I live in have been out of sight, out of mind when it comes to seeing what's underneath the water. This picture right here is um, of our boat. We're in 30 feet of water here and you really can't see five feet in front of your face. There's a little bit of a disconnect when it comes to the Minas Basin and just not understanding the appreciative life that is under these waters. And until I started fishing over 200 tides a year in the Minas Basin, did I truly realize that firsthand the plentiful bounty that we do have. And as my love for the inner Bay of Fundy grew, I knew I had to share the wealth because it's not just muddy water to me. I'm here to talk about step zero and the very beginnings. And when brought with this topic, I instantly thought the very beginning thing is working together. And by working together, I, I'm not here to teach a room full of adults how to work together. I think we generally know how to do that but I mean all knowledge systems and bringing together all knowledge systems such as academic, indigenous and local. Um, it'll create a more complete, accurate understanding. What I mean by different knowledge systems, I'll just give a little bit of an explanation is academics generally know by, they ask a question, they'll find a way to answer it normally by a scientific method. Um, local, knowledge, or local knowledge is through experience, seasonal timing and Trust me, a lot of trial and error. Um, traditional or indigenous knowledge is through generations and generations of living on the land and storytelling. I believe you need all these knowledges because you can't create a whole picture with only one piece of the puzzle or one knowledge system. Um, for example, every knowledge system brings something special to the table, like an Atlantic tomcod. They can be understood in a variety of ways. Atlantic tomcod are an important species to the Mi'kmaq. It is the only fish in the Mi'kmaq calendar. It's referred to as frost fish because it spawns in January, meaning it's most plentiful during times where food isn't as available. As a local knowledge holder, we have learned through time and experience of setting our gear and figuring out when tomcod is most abundant in the river. Scientific knowledge, they aim to again, answer a question and in this case, we'll talk about the timing of tomcod spawning. To do that, they figure out a lot of cool ways and measure gonad development. I'm not a scientist, so the picture looks really cool, but <laughs> um, my dad and I are small scale fishers. Each of us, or each year, we follow the Gaspar run to the tidal barrier of the Avon River. We would fish day and night, tide after tide, and those long hours made me appreciate the beauty of these waters, but saddened by the challenges these thriving rivers face. We also ran a low tide weir in the Minas Basin and everybody was welcome to visit during these operations. Um, these pictures kind of show how high our tides really are. This weir, the photo to the left, um, is about a kilometer offshore and it's about 10 to 12 feet high. So at high tide, this is about 40 feet underwater. So it's, it's pretty cool to uh, experience if you've ever gotten a chance to. Um, our weir captured over 50 different species per year, which provided ample opportunity for students to get hands-on experience. Many academic studies took place here. Because of the diversity of species that were caught, we, will, we were able to host a range of research projects the weir experience grew in popularity due to the tangible connection to the intertidal muddy flats. This offered a unique experience for students and all the public to experience the bounty of the Minas Basin. The weir hasn't been operating for almost four years now, but people still often ask if and when we plan to up op or open it again. 
And it's really humbling to know that they had such a positive experience at the Weir. Um, this, it shows that if given the opportunity to learn that people will come um, and they, they want to learn, they want to know what's in, I say, our muddy waters. Since the Weir, we have been working on a monitoring, stu monitoring study in collaboration with a local university, Acadia, and the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. We're trying to break down the barrier between these knowledge systems. Our collective goals are to protect fish in the environment, ensure the sustainability for the future, continuously educate and bring awareness to the awe of this estuary. We work side by side in a small dory, six days a week, setting nets and traps, collecting data for 10 months of the year. Although I got these three days off to be here. Thanks dad, if you're watching. <laughs> Um, we're creating such an extensive data set on a, on a river that was once so plentiful and full of fish, life, and culture. About 50 years, the Avon River, which previously looked like this, was blocked off with a causeway and an abato structure. Essentially, if anybody doesn't know, an abato is a gated structure that allows freshwater outflow on a low tide and obstructs tidal water entry during high tide. Water levels in the Avon could be manipulated, although they often stayed shut. The gates were kept closed over 80% of the year for the last 50 years, eliminating saltwater entry and simply releasing water when needed. This caused water to impound above the causeway, effectively creating a freshwater wet reservoir, which locally it's known as the lake. And you can see that on the left side of the photo. Now, I mean, a lake doesn't sound too bad, right? I mean, it offers recreational place for locals such as paddling and irrigation source for local farms. However, the consequences of managing a tidal river in this way creates many complications. Considering issues of water quality due to lack of flow and stagnation, sediment buildup on either side of the barrier, essentially over time filling in the river channel as uh, you could see in this diagram here. Um, but what may be most concerning to me personally is the fish passage. So species need to travel up upstream to spawn like alewife, river herring, salmon, and under the tidal gate management schedules, they were only able to pass at specific times the gates were opened, typically a couple weeks in the spring. Even though the gates were opened, the force of the water was often too great to permit successful passage passage upstream due to the volume of water impounded upstream. These species need an adequate flow of water from both upstream and down with no blockage to successfully live out their life cycle. Some species even need a push of tidal water to pass the barrier. So without the necessary flows for all species, poor upstream water quality and lack of necessary flows to maintain life during the gate closure, they were typically not able to pass. So as the structure was managed, it reduced the productivity of the fisheries rights, but also infringed on indigenous rights to fish. For example, if you extirpate a species like Interbea fundi Atlantic salmon, for example, which is not only an endangered species, but it's also cer a ceremonial species, you're basically eliminating the right to fish because even though the right is there to fish, if you take away that species, you're essentially taking away the right to practice. And none of this sat right with us. Um, another driver that solidified for us that working together is essential was an ecological study done in the Windsor Causeway many, many years ago. The study ended up capturing one American eel on the seaward side of the causeway during its entirety. Now, my dad and I know that being commercial fishers in that exact same spot know that that is not a complete and true representation of what is there. We knew that bringing our knowledge of that system to the table, knowing what gear to use and how to use it, how to properly deploy it in seasonal timing could benefit the overall accuracy of the study. It could create a clearer picture and essentially just create a clearer picture. <laughs> I went off my script a little bit. <laughs> but this, uh, this picture is what we do on a daily basis. We set nets, set traps, and we catch fish, we're fishermen. It's 
it's what we know how to do. And these traps were set for one hour. And this particular trap has about 40 to 50 eels in it compared to one eel fished on the whole entirety of the study. And it's not that they got, they were wrong in how they did it. That is the, that is the results that they got and they're, they were right because they did catch one eel, but it's not a true representation of what is in that river. So after working tirelessly, our collective research showed that fish passage was, as we knew it, non-existent for most of the year and for most species. The fish were not gaining access and that they needed to travel upstream and successfully spawn. In 2020, the fisheries minister brought the Abato structure into compliance with a ministerial order based on the consultation that used our collective knowledge to make an informed decision. This order states that the river shall be restored to its natural state where no water is being impounded, fully opening both gates through each outgoing tide and fully opening both gates through each incoming tide for a minimum of 10 minutes. Um, this, active, this order is still active to this day. And for the first time in about 50 years, there's been both incoming and outgoing flow all year round. Um, although the change in the gate operations was widely accepted as a positive outcome, it was not embraced by the entirety of the community. Many issues emerged as a result of the change in water level management. Um, it was status quo for many years and um, the reservoir was important to many users like local ski hill who drew water during the ski season for making snow. A recreational paddling club needed a new body of water to conduct its competitions and, safe, and safety concerns for the town, like a loss of a fire hydrant. These are all valid concerns and may sound overwhelming to begin to address, but we knew there was an alternative option for all the concerns raised. Our approach used active listening to really understand the needs of all users and stakeholders. In many cases, a stronger relationship was forged with with other stakeholders as we face adversity together. By understanding their concerns, practical solutions were able, able to be tabled through preservation and dedication. These solutions became a reality. Ski Martok, for example, was able to secure a water source within the river by completing a river restoration project. And this is just one example of how compassion and understanding led to effective compromise. Currently, there is a highway twinning project occurring and it remains to be seen if a new causeway water control structure is to be installed in that same spot. Our collective ways of knowing are continually working together to monitor this river to ensure an effective fish passage in the event that another structure is installed, um, that structure will be able to provide passage and they'll have the foundation to provide passage for all species, all times. Um, working on the study together means that experience is shared. It's humbling to work side by side, academics and ind indigenous, realizing that even though our methods are different, we all have a passion for the environment. Each one of us handles fish, but see something, but see something different, but see something in a different way. <laughs> now, onto the topic of handling fish, um, I want to shine a light on our students because the importance of gaining hands-on knowledge is unmatched. They're young adults who don't know exactly what they wanna do when they finish school, but they're steering towards the root of biology normally when they come in our boat. Um, we work in all weather, rain, shine, snow, although lightning does seem to keep us off the water for some reason, um, but it humbles you, especially in January, as you can see in the left. Um, <laughs> they're able to leave their studies knowing they gained a hands-on knowledge. Usually before the students step in the boat for the first time, they've often never handled a fish. And I tell you, we've gotten every reaction when it comes to when they're gonna go measure an eel. I mean, there's so many grunts and groans and a lot of swear words, <laughs> but by the end of it, um, this is Josh and look at the smile on his face. Like he, he loves them now, I think. Uh, <laughs> but I promise you an eel looks a lot calmer on a spreadsheet as a number than it does when you go to pick it up. 
Um, working together is much more than just creating a more true, credible product. It's about respecting and embracing the similarities and differences, building relationships, sharing goals, being open to change, active listening, offering unconditional support, but most importantly, having fun. And these are just a couple other photos, I guess, and now I'm done. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eric. I love that example, sort of a different example of small scale fishing from Nova Scotia. And I it can't, I, it couldn't help um, but reminding me when you were talking about uh, sort of the discrepancies of how you're doing stock assessments of New England fisheries. So you, you would be right at home in the cod fishery in Gloucester. Um, I'd like to now introduce um, Tyler Eddy who will be joining us. Um, Tyler is the team lead at the Life Aquatic and the Fisheries and Marine Institute, Memorial University, Newfoundland. Tyler is interested in past, present and future human interactions with an ecology of marine ecosystems. Tyler is one of the founding coordinators of the Fisheries and Marine Ecosystem Model Intercomparison Project and is a visiting scientist at the Charles Darwin Foundation on the Galapagos Islands, Ecuador. Tyler was a research fellow at the University of South Carolina in the United States with the NEREAS program, a research associate at the University of British Columbia, Canada with the NEREAS program, and a postdoctoral fellow at Dal Dalhousie University in Canada with the Lenfest Ocean program. He received his PhD in marine biology from Victoria University of Wellington, New, uh, New Zealand, and an honors ba bachelor's of science in marine biology from Dalhousie in Canada. Welcome, Tyler. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, the invitation to speak here. And uh, it's great to, to see everyone in person again. So this is my first in-person conference talk. So I apologize if I'm a bit rusty, um, but it's kind of exciting because it's the first time in my career that I'm presenting the work that was led by one of my PhD students. So I just like to acknowledge uh, Abe Solberg, who's at the back of the room, uh, as well as uh, <laughs> a couple of my other PhD students are here who are also working on ecosystem-based fisheries management work. So uh, Matt Robertson is at the same table and Raquel Ruiz Diaz. So it's, a, it's exciting to, you know, sort of pass the torch on and, and speak about some of the work that, you know, we're developing together. So today I'm going to speak about, um, I apologize, it's the Mac to PC conversion there, um, principles and approaches for ecosystem-based fisheries management. And uh, I'm based at the, um, the Fisheries and Marine Institute, which is one of the campuses here on Memorial University. We don't have the seals. We're not in Logie Bay. We don't have those big cliffs. Um, you won't visit there tonight. We're up on the hill a little bit farther from the Mun campus, but we've got the world's largest flume tank. So that's our claim to fame. <laughs> So when Evan uh, asked me to speak about conservation in terms of, you know, how it relates to the work that we do, which is more sort of fisheries based, it sort of, you know, made me think of, you know, what are we conserving? You know, typically we think about marine conservation, you might think about, you know, the marine ecosystems, the habitats, you know, the forage fish, the key links within the ecosystems. So this is a video that I took in um, Middle Cove, which is just, you know, 15 minutes drive north of St. John's. This is the Capelin um, running. Unfortunately, they're not running right now. So you're not going to be able to go in the water and have this experience unless they show up in the next couple of days. But, um, you know, this was one of my first experiences in the water in Newfoundland, you know, two steps off the beach in Middle Cove and, and seeing this um, this wonderful phenomenon that brings, you know, the humpbacks from the Caribbean, it brings the cod from, you know, the shelf break offshore and really connects, you know, the energy flowing through the ecosystems. So, you know, is that, you know, what we're thinking about conserving when we talk about conservation? 
Um, within Newfoundland, obviously, we have the history of the Cod Moratorium now with the 30th anniversary. Are we thinking about, you know, the culture that is associated with this land and trying to conserve that way of life? And, you know, the communities that they support. So this is a small outport on the south coast of Newfoundland. Um, and we know that there was, you know, large impacts from the mismanagement of that cod fishery, not only on the conservation of the stocks, but, you know, the culture and, and the way of life as we know it. And uh, a disclaimer, I'm from the mainland, I'm from Nova Scotia, but, um, you know, this is an Atlantic salmon that my father and my brother and I caught behind the river uh, where I grew up. And unfortunately, now you're not able to catch and keep salmon in that same river. So, you know, conservation of these, you know, family generations and passing on these experiences from one generation to another. So these are all the sort of things I was thinking about in terms of conservation and, and, and how we think about it and what are really the priorities. So today I want to speak about ecosystem-based fisheries management, which I think really is a good way to think about step zero in conservation, you know, what are the different ways that we can manage ecosystems to prevent things like the cod fishery collapse. Um, and if you've ever delved into the ecosystem based fisheries management management literature or EBFM as it's commonly referred to, you'll know that it's a vast literature, it's, you know, growing exponentially in the number of papers that are published. A lot of Western nations now have EBFM as one of their guiding principles in their fisheries management and sustainability. Um, but oftentimes there's a lot of different definitions of what EBFM actually is. Different nations have different ways of implementing it. And so it can be a little bit you know, confusing in terms of what are the key principles and approaches you know, that we can use within EBFM to achieve some of these conservation outcomes that we might uh, desire. So this is a, a figure from NOAA um, this kind of summarizes the different levels of management as we sort of think about them within fisheries. So if we start at the bottom, it's kind of the classic single species fisheries management. You look at the population of cod, you try to understand if it's increasing or decreasing. You adjust your quota appropriately every year, and then the fishers go out and catch that amount of cod. So we realized, you know, through history that sometimes there's external factors that are important to consider beyond just the dynamics of the, the species itself. So they're influenced by the environment, they're influenced by, you know, their predators and their prey source, such as capelin. Um, so that, you know, gives rise to the, the next level up, which is referred to as the ecosystem approach to fisheries management. So in this instance, you might be considering the influence of climate, the influence of habitat, as well as uh, the ecology of the species. If we move up to the third level, we have EBFM or ecosystem-based fisheries management, which also, you know, might consider not only the individual species that you're interested in, cod, you might consider the dynamics of uh, their prey, such as capelin, for example. And then at the highest level, we have uh, EBM, which is ecosystem-based management. And here we see, you know, all of these other different things that we might be doing in the ocean, such as tourism, oil and gas, uh, wind farms, which are now a really big thing off of uh, the Northeast coast of the US. Uh, and then we also see conservation that falls in this EBFM uh, umbrella. But I would argue that perhaps, you know, if we're going to think about habitat and the integrity of ecosystems, we should also be considering um, conservation measures within EBFM as well. So really, this was kind of uh, how we came to this uh, research, and this is still ongoing. So this is not a finished product. So I'd welcome any feedback um, if you have, you know, suggestions or different views. So basically the way that it happened was uh, we did a literature review of the common approaches that uh, are used to apply EBFM. Um, we looked at key principles. So these are the different processes that uh, you know, are being used to implement them as well as the different, different uh, outcomes, how well they're achieving each of these different goals. And then we scored how well each approach met the, the goals of each one of these principles. So I'm just going to summarize um, uh, a bit of uh, what our findings were in terms of what these approaches were and some of the outcomes. And I think we've heard a few times within the past uh, day from Alad Abundi, who spoke about this systems level view of why it's important to understand the dynamics of uh, the food web and the ecosystem. Um, 
as well as Erin Carruthers in her talk yesterday, where you know you can't just focus on the redfish, for example. You need to also understand what's happening with the shrimp and the halibut and how all these things are interacting with each other in the system. So the review of the literature showed that the, the common approaches, um, there's four of them that we identified, and the first of which is uh, ecosystem indicators. So basically, how do we measure what's happening in the ecosystem in order to be able to you know, monitor it and come up with some management actions. And generally a good indicator is measurable, uh, it's understandable and it's cost effective. And it, typically for this purpose, you'd want it to be sensitive to something like the environment and the fishing, which is what we're trying to track or manage. And two of the, um, the indicators that kind of stood out that sort of ticked all these boxes that you might you know, use if you're trying to understand what's happening with your ecosystem uh, our, there's one called a large fish index, which basically shows that, you know, you have a, a healthy population representing, you know, the larger individuals as well as the younger individuals. Um, so this will give you an indication of your population level health. If you have only small juvenile individuals in a, a fishing population, it's generally a warning sign or for an ecosystem health. So we've heard about um, fishing down the food webs from Daniel Polly, where, you know, the top predators get removed and that's an indication of an overfished uh, ecosystem. And then there's a second indicator, which is something related to the productivity of the system. So in this instance, we're looking at the ratio of net primary productivity to the amount of fisheries catch that you're taking out of the system. So basically making sure that there's enough productivity in the system to support the amount of fish that you're taking. And that will give you a, an indication of ecosystem health and fishery sustainability. Uh, another common approach to, uh, to think about EBFM is to kind of scale up these single species stock assessment models that are typically used by DFO to make fisheries management decisions to consider the other components of the ecosystem. So sort of a food web approach. So this again relates to the comments that Aaron Carruthers was saying about the relationships between um, shrimp and redfish in the Gulf, for example. So understanding, you know, there's complex pathways of how energy flows from the primary producers all through the system. Um, understanding the, the ecosystem structure, the function, these different connections and the flow of energy, how they're influenced by the environment, how they'll change with climate change, uh, considering the feeding interactions. And then when we have this model that kind of includes these interactions, we can use them to run fishing or climate change scenarios to see what might happen if you have a, a strong recruitment event of redfish in the Gulf. What, you know, what are they eating? What implications does that have for the energy flowing through the system? And the, this approach is often used for a management strategy evaluation. So running a, a range of different management scenarios and seeing what implications that would have um, for the ecosystem. And so typically what an ecosystem model is, is a, it's a representation of the food web that you see in the top and some sort of abstraction of how the energy flows from the base of the food web shown on the bottom of the pyramid up through the higher trophic levels. And that inner gray um, shaded area that you can see is the amount of biomass if you assume that 10% of energy flows from one level to the next. So you can see by the time you're at the top of the food web, there's a very small proportion of the biomass that we initially started out with. So understanding these basic laws of you know, how energy flows and conservation of mass is, is the approach that we use to understand, you know, things at a system level versus an individual species level. Uh, another common approach that we uh, identified in the EBFM literature was stakeholder consultation. And we've heard a lot about this so far in the conference. Um, so that can be used to identify what the priorities of the stakeholders are um, and what the trade-offs might, might be. Um, it can be used to see if there is agreement among stakeholders about how to manage these different trade-offs. Oftentimes, you know, you can't have everything within a system. And as we've heard a number of times already, it, it can be an effective way to integrate Indigenous and, and local knowledge within the decision-making process. And then this speaks, I guess, probably most directly to uh, the conservation uh, aspect. But uh, area-based management, uh, marine protected areas are typically a way we might think about this or marine spatial planning. Um, these are spatial temporal closures. Um, sometimes they have different restrictions about what types of gear types are being able to use or if there's any tourism uh, operations that are allowed in them. And in this graphic here, I've got um, 
some of the marine conservation areas that you can find around Newfoundland and Labrador. And there's a number of different types that uh, are implemented. So they can be used for biodiversity protection, um, protection of uh, vulnerable benthic habitats. For example, if there's a, a glass sponge garden that's really sensitive to trawling, you know, you can close that area to, to protect them. Uh, typically for these approaches, the biological dis success depends on uh, what are referred to as the Neoli attributes. So no take, uh, enforced, old, large, and isolated. So that's after about 20 years of biological monitoring of marine protected areas. And there's been some work done that's shown that the social success depends on having adequate um, staff and budget capacity, you know, for those areas, for the enforcement and for the monitoring and the communication uh, of, of what the regulations are. So those are the, the key approaches that are typically used to implement EBFM. Um, we also identified some of the key principles uh, and, um, and scored, you know, how each of those different approaches uh, worked at achieving these, these different principles. So I have those four approaches shown here uh, on the x-axis of that table, and then I'll just go through each of these different processes. So the first thing you'll notice is that not any approach sort of achieves all of these different processes equally. So if you want to manage at a ecologically appropriate scales, for example, perhaps your ecosystem models can help you determine that uh, scale as well as a stakeholder consultation. We also identified um, the processes of uh, incorporating a variety of stakeholders. So obviously the stakeholder cons consultation approach um, is the best to achieve that process. process. Um, also considering uncertainty and trade-offs. So the ecosystem models are really good at you know, running these different management strategy evaluations. If we wanna catch all this redfish, what will it mean for the shrimp? And then consider the interconnected nature of human environmental systems and trophic pathways. So again, this really highlights that, you know, there's a, a range of different approaches and not any one approach is, approach is gonna kind of achieve all of these different uh, process goals that you might have. And we did the same sort of thing for identifying uh, the key outcomes. So avoiding habitat degradation, typically your area-based management will be, you know, the best approach for that. Minimizing risk of changes to natural communities and processes, and then maintaining long-term socioeconomic benefits without jeopardizing the ecosystem. So this was our, uh, our first cut of trying to you know, cut through the EBFM literature, identify what the key approaches are, the different processes and outcomes um, that have been used, and then how well, you know, if you want to prioritize one of these things, which you know, approaches might be the best. So just in summary, um, effective EBFM implementation and positive socio-ecological outcomes require strategic use of multiple complementary approaches. So I would suggest, you know, when you're at this step zero and thinking about conservation, you might go through this process and see, okay, what is it that we want to achieve and what are the approaches that are best suited and what might be most palatable to our stakeholders? And conservation planning that includes resource use should consider the processes and outcomes that achieve the conservation goals and tailor approaches accordingly. So again, I just bring it back to the first slide of, you know, what is it that we're thinking about when we're thinking about conservation? Is it, you know, the habitats, the forage fish, the, you know, outport communities in rural Newfoundland, or, you know, the experiences that you could have with, with your next generation? And that's my contact info. And I'd be happy to take any questions during the question period. So thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler. It, it, you know, I just, I've not been thinking about EBFM for a long time or for a, a bit. And just hearing you talking about fisheries management at such a large scale just reminded me what a complex and difficult thing it is. And I think I had more compassion for people who do that than I have had in the past. Um, is Brice here? No, I'm online. Oh, he's online, excellent. Oh, okay, I thought you were in the room somewhere. Um, all right, well, I, it's my great pleasure to introduce Brice Trullier, am I pronouncing that right, please? 
Yeah, it's good. Oh, good. It's okay. Good enough? <laughs> yeah, good enough. <laughs> Uh, Brice is a geographer whose research focuses on ocean geography, more specifically on the relations between human groups and maritime space. Through the lens of STS and critical approaches, he particularly uses the case of fisheries and maritime renewable energy in marine spatial planning to study how power relations and knowledge issues intertwine with geotechnological devices, maps, data, and portals that ultimately shape socio-technological engagements, forming an intermediate with the marine environment. To date, he's received seven grants worth over 2.1 million euros, which is a little less than it was a couple of weeks ago, um, for, re <laughs> for research programs as a coordinator and has been involved in 16 others as a participant or as a, 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 a a WP leader. He's the director of LETG, a CNRS research laboratory, which gathers around 120 faculty members and PhD researchers. And, uh, and he can provide more information on that. Without further ado, thank you so much, please, for being here. And um, please uh, share your presentation with us. Okay, we do this. Do you hear me clearly? Yes, we do. And is that okay? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, this, share. I cannot uh, share my screen. Maybe the, the main uh, animator should, uh, should change. We're working on it. Okay. Try again. Okay, it seems good now. Um, wait a minute, please. Where are you calling us? In, where are you calling in from, please? Sorry? Where are you calling in from? I'm calling from France. Okay, from Nantes. Yeah, that's it. So do you do you see my screen? We do, it looks beautiful. We're ready for you. <laughs> okay, so maybe I can turn off. Oh, we'd love right? to see your face. Okay, How do we do that? Evan, Evan wants to see your face. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you for giving me the floor. Ah, here we go. Yeah, for this short presentation. Um, I'm very pleased to be part of this session, uh, even I'm, I'm sad not to be with you today in St. John's. I, I would have been there, but I, I have had to cancel my trip uh, last week for personal reason. Um, anyway, I'm Brice Trouillet, I'm a geographer at uh, North University, France, and I, I specialized in relationships between fisheries and marine spatial planning through, as you, as you mentioned, Patricia, a question of uh, geographical information and power relations. So um, as an introduction to our discussions, I will draw your attention on three basic ingredients that seems important to me at step zero for marine conservation. This is based on my experience in France and in other Atlantic countries. And it is related to the purpose of marine conservation, uh, the basis on which it should lay, and the way it should uh, work according to me. So, the first question is, conserving what and what for? Okay, in the European Union, the Habitat Directive listed the different marine habitats that have to be conserved. So as you can see on the table on the right, uh, through the different types of habitat listed, the mere definition of these habitats is an issue that effectively refers to the very objectives of conservation. But overall, conservation is related to um, uh, it, sorry, it not only deal with nature, it should go beyond this and take into account um, communities, 
ways of life, cultures, and different stuff like this. So we must better capture the cultural processes that interwent, intertwined, sorry, with nat natural processes. All the elements that are invoked in marine conservation play an important role in the relationships between people about nature. We need to properly conceptualize what conservation is all about and all the things that mediate relationships between people about nature conservation issues. As someone told us earlier today, uh, we do not manage na nature. We only try to manage people that are trying to conserve nature. So I think that at step zero, it seems important to me to clearly define what is to be conserved, why, and for whom, seeing these three points as a kind of assemblage. A second stream of question could be related to on which basis should we conserve and by whom. As somebody told a few minutes ago, considering diverse knowledges is essential. I think that non-scientific knowledge is as much as important as academic knowledge. So we should both integrate all of them. Non-scientific knowledge counts. We need to free ourselves from the often artificial division between scientific and non-scientific knowledge. There can be no overarching knowledge, but all knowledge must be able to enrich and challenge each other. Nor it is just a question of valuing non-scientific knowledge or assembling the different types of knowledge. It is also a question of co-producing data, co-processing data, co-using information and so on, and ultimately co-managing. We need long-term cooperation between the different types of knowledge and cooperation has to go much more beyond the only production of data. Also, conservation targets are defined out of any social and cultural consideration, 10%, 20%, 30%. What does it mean for local communities? How can it be translated in real life? So at step zero again, it seems important to me to consider all kinds of knowledge and hold to design targets according to the people needs who depend on marine resources. Third stream of question about how should we conserve and how far? The first point is that ocean is not enough. Yeah, it's already big, but not enough. Um, despite a very dense network of MPAs in France in, in this example, the land-sea connection is totally neglected, making the measures put in place de facto ineffective. So we have to pay attention to terrestrial threats such as pollution or infrastructures in order to improve the conservation. Also, one should be careful not to confuse the thermometer with the fever. In the French case, we have more than 32% of marine areas with marine protected areas already beyond the 2030 targets, but just a few have a management plan to date. So more than this, a second target 
is to have 10% of highly or strongly here marine protected areas by uh, 2030. Again, as you can see here on the decree, uh, all depends on what wine defines as strong in this case. This text has, has um, raised a lot of debate in France because uh, at the very uh, last moment, um, we introduced the notion of strongly limited rather than only be avoided or suppressed. So it's a very important change in the, in the spirit of this text. Maybe one of the most important thing is to be able to shift to a new paradigm or something new, considering that conservation costs less than doing nothing. So this is probably the price of success at step zero. These are just my three main ideas I would like to bring to the discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, please. Um, it, it's really great. I'm seeing, you know, very localized case studies, um, questions around policy modeling. And uh, this next speaker um, will add a different dimension to this as well. I'm delighted to introduce a friend and colleague from NOAA Fisheries, Patricia Clay. I'd love to see her face to ensure that we actually do have her, that it's real. Because I know she's been, hey, let's give hey. her a round of applause just because she got online this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Trish, uh, Dr. Clay is a, an anthropologist from NOAA Fisheries. Her primary research interests are social and cultural aspects of fisheries and fishing communities as they relate to ecosystem-based management and social impact assessment. Current projects include investigating the rising average age of fishermen, understanding compliance behavior, and assessing climate impacts on community social well-being. Trish is a chair of the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas Working Group on Maritime Systems and a chair of the Society of Applied Anthropology's Topical Interest Group on Fisheries and Coastal Communities and on the leadership team of the IOOC Ocean Societal Indicators Task Team. And I know I can say for probably a bunch of us in the room that she's the glue that holds a lot of us together. So th thank you, Trish, for the work that you do, and thanks for being here. My pleasure. I will now try to share my screen. Okay. Okay, and let's see if I can. Make this go into presentation mode. There we go. All right, so um, I'm gonna start with this. This is not a title, it's just a kind of a, a framing mechanism, which is that managing fisheries requires the integration of social and ecological dimensions. I don't think that's something anyone would disagree with. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about data issues, which I think is one of the important step zero components. Um, and obviously there are many types of ecological data that we still need uh, to improve. But I would venture to say that we have a broader range of ecological data than we do of social data in general. And yet we all know <laughs> Boats don't fish, people do. So the people side is a really critical aspect of the marine ecosystem that we often don't, not necessarily pay as much attention to, but it's much harder in some cases 
to acquire data. And certainly um, in the US, there are all kinds of rules about when you can, uh, as a government agency, um, conduct data collections on people um, that make it uh, harder to do the kinds of data collection we would like. Recently, however, uh, the current administration has uh, written a lot of executive orders, which are essentially laws um, about um, environmental justice and equity. And those have opened kind of a, a path forward for us to perhaps um, push for better data collection. Well, we know a lot about what goes on in the various regions at a regional level. Um, a lot of it is, um, very little of it is um, sort of universal collection. It's um, just subsets. And apart from some uh, national level social indicators for fishing communities that are based on census data, as well as landings data, permits, number of dealers, that sort of thing, that is available nationally, um, we don't have any national data collections, common data collections, which makes it very difficult to really understand what's going on nationwide. There's, there's just not, you can't compare regions because easily because the data collections are regional based and not all conducted in exactly the same way. Um, but right now there is really a focus on underrepresented populations and underserved communities. Now, what do those things mean? So an underrepresented population, we're talking about um, groups of individuals who are allied perhaps by the work that they do or the fishery that they're in. Whereas the underserved communities, we're talking about communities that uh, have not received as much attention in the past for a variety of reasons. And so what we're really looking to do now is identify the, uh, where these populations and communities are, what their characteristics are, and what kind of research do we need to do in order to get those data. And this is all in the service of improving our understanding of the impact of NOAA's regulatory actions on these various groups. So there are a number of just really basic types of data that we would like, but don't have nationally. And that's the demographic composition of fishery participants. And when I say, that's basically occupations, but we're talking about on the water occupations. We're talking about um, captains, owners, crew. You know, there's often a machinist or a cook who may also be fishing, but may not be. And then when we talk about communities, we're talking about towns, basically, or ports. And for all of these groups, we would like to know details about ethnicity and race, about age, about sex and gender. And we have right now, even at a regional level, relatively limited um, information region-wide anywhere. And it's not um, universal collection, mostly it's samples. But these data are really important if we're going to look at some of the key issues that we have right now. One is, you know, the graying of the fleet, so-called. There's a lot of evidence that the average age of a fisher is rising across the country. And there've been various, um, some regional surveys, there've been some regional collections of, uh, interview data, oral history data, um, all of which confirm this, 
but we can't actually say with certainty exactly what the change has been because we don't have the data on age of participants. We also want to um, identify entry exit patterns and barriers to entry. And we know that some of those barriers may be related to some of these demographic categories. But while we may have an individual study here or there, which points to that, again, we can't do a broad scale study and say, these are the factors that are most commonly um, found as barriers or uh, found to in fact, make it easier for someone to get in or to leave. So we're looking at the social vulnerabilities of industry participants, both on land and on the water, by which I mean, we're not just looking for data about people who fish on the water. We also are looking for data on groups like um, processing plant employees or lumpers or um, bait and tackle shop employees or people who work in gear sheds. There's so many support industries on land um, that have received much less in, uh, attention than the fish, certain good reasons, but people would not be out fishing without all of these support industries. And we really don't know um, much of anything in terms of actual counts of people uh, in those in industries. There's some individual studies where, you know, we know, for instance, um, in a lot of places, processing plant workers tend to be immigrants. Some are undocumented. Um, and that of course makes it even harder if you want to actually go in and do some sort of a census of the populations. But those are all things you have to work around in, in all these cases. I mentioned that we do have um, national level census data and uh, landings data at which we have uh, created into a set of community social vulnerability indicators, sometimes just shorthanded as social indicators. And so we already know that, uh, oh, there's a question. Nope. Should I take that question now? Thanks, Trish. No, you can keep going and we'll I, save that question to the end. Hear. For some can reason you, right now. Can you hear me, Trish? I can just barely hear you. <laughs> We're going to save that question till the end. You can just keep going. Yes, maybe we'll have to wait till the end. I don't know what it is about sharing that is somehow interrupting my, my ability to hear you. All right, well, I'll just continue. And then uh, when I stop, um, I'll take any questions. So if you look here, you can see the dark blue bars are commercial fishing communities and the light blue bars are other communities in coastal counties. And nationwide, you'll see that these three measures of um, we're calling, we're using them now as uh, indicators of potential environmental justice issues. Are poverty, which measures economic and social position based on income and population composition, which shows the presence of populations that may have fewer resources just in general, not just uh, income, but other types of resources. And then personal disruption measures an individual's ability to respond to change due to personal circumstances, such as education or employment status. And in all cases, fishing communities are ranked as much higher on these levels of potentially problematic characteristics than other communities. So 
again, just to say that there's, you know, uh, you think of, oh, well, NOAA, US, the, they have data, but even though we do have probably more data than a lot of places, we still don't have data that we feel is really sufficient to understand our fisheries and the support systems within those fisheries. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. Thank you so much, Trish. Can you hear me now, by the way? Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, in the interest of time and in the interest of wanting to engage the people who have been listening so patiently and probably are filled with great ideas, thoughts, and questions, I, I think I'd like to move to questions coming from the audience and would need a mic to do so. Is that the mic that we're going to use over there? That one's empty. Oh, you've got it. Okay. Um, so... Are, why don't we start with the people on the online, um, Evan? No, let's go to the audience. Okay, Madeline. Go right ahead. No, no, no. They're fighting over <laughs> who's gonna, this is how exciting this panel is, I love it. <laughs> Thanks, uh, I, I'm gonna start with the, the last with Trisha's. Uh, presentation. I, it was really fantastic. And I want to say that from the start that I really am fully supportive of this whole concept of collecting data on the people, not just on the fish and the technology. However, um, I find it a little like closing the barn door. Um, we've been having social impact statements for 30 years that I know about. And nothing changes. The, 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 the rules and the regulations fail to take into account the, the human side, the human dimensions. And those of us that are social scientists have been screaming about this for at least 30 years and nothing changes. So what I want to know is if you get this data that you're saying that we don't have, what's going to change and how? Why? Trish, I'll let you take that. <laughs> well, it's everything you said is entirely true, Madeline. Um, but we've both been working on trying to acquire more data and on improving uh, the ways that SIAs, social impact assessments, are conducted. And in fact, uh, Lisa Colburn and I in 2020 published a tech memo which is specifically about how to conduct a fisheries SIA and has step-by-step -step guidelines and um, discussions of data sources and of data gathering techniques. And uh, so we're hoping that that will help people who are perhaps less skilled um, or have not done SIAs before, if you already really know how to do an SIA, it might be useful because it also discusses all the various laws and policies that impact SIA. Um, but I think the other thing is that it's just so much of what is done in um, an environmental impact statement is to provide numerical data. And I think our ability to have more numerical data can make it easier for council members to compare data across the, you know, the, the different levels, the ecological level, the economic, you get ecological impacts, you get economic impacts, you get social impacts. And I think that will help to some degree to be able to flesh out some of the, um, perception that the social impact assessment is not as rigorous, which I think has been uh, problematic in the past. Thank you, Trish. We have another question. Do you mind when you uh, pop your mic on, just say your name and also just how you fit into all this so we all get to know each other a little better? Sure, thanks. My mic has popped, that's on. Uh, 
my name is Megan Bailey. I'm at Dalhousie University. Um, thanks, everyone. I just wanted to firstly say thank you to Erica, as somebody who's visited the Weir. Um, thanks to you and your dad for opening that up. When is it opening again? <laughs> just kidding. Um, but I have a, a question. I mean, it's based from Tyler's talk, but kind of for everyone, which is it made me sad to see that stakeholder consultation is really great at process, but the poorest in terms of outcomes if I understood your summary diagram the best. So as you know, we think people are important and participatory governance is important. So I'm just curious from everyone, how do we not trade off outcomes by including people? We're live, test, can you hear me or, yeah. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm not a social scientist, so I, <laughs> not gonna to try to provide a, an answer to that. Um, yeah, I'm, honestly, I don't, I don't have a clear answer, but I think it's a, it's a great point. Um, I guess I'm thinking, you know, through these, uh, you know, DFO stock assessment meetings where, you know, a lot of the different voices at the table are represented in terms of the fishing industry and the conservation community and, you know, that the scientists themselves and how to weigh, you know, these different objectives in a different fashion. That's the, the first thing that sort of comes to my mind in terms of, you know, where do we place the, the greatest emphasis? So um, I haven't thought deeply about that yet. And uh, if you have any suggestions or ideas, but I'd also like to open up the, the question to other people. And I see Ratana has got her hand up there. I'm going to try a little bit, right, because uh, what, what, what I thought I heard today from four presenters, especially starting from Erica, is the real importance of engaging and integrating different types of knowledge, bringing all the experience and everything. When we started to look at the way we go about having this kind of uh, model or strategies or framework, stakeholder consultation become just an aspect of it. Briz actually was trying to say that there is something called long-term uh, cooperation that we might want to be thinking about. And of course, there's a lot of data you need to bring in order to support that. So I like to channel the question to Erica and say, what would, what would make you feel that your work is really important and integral to the whole process of um, you know, whether it's going to be uh, ecosystem-based management, marine conservation, and other initiatives that we are trying to do, what would, me, what would be meaningful from your perspective? Thank you. Um, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, honestly, just results. I mean, I think it comes as easy as we're, we're here, we're putting the work in, we're... Um, working together and it's just as simple as we would love to see results. Like I am here at this table, which is, a, it's a step, right? Um, bringing everybody together, it's, it's just another step. I like to simplify things and just say, show me results, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, Please or Trish, did either of you want to uh, comment on either that, that, that last question or the question before? Yeah, I'll, I'll make a comment. I think, you know, when we say stakeholder involvement, that can mean lots of different things to different people. And I think that's where some of the issues about whether or not it really impacts the final results come in. Because um, I'm also involved in a project through uh, WG Mars where we interviewed IEA um, working group chairs. And, and we found very different definitions of what stakeholder involvement meant. And sometimes it was just, um, they can tell us uh, additional data about the fish that you know, they might have observed. And sometimes it was, we're doing, um, cooperative meetings where we discuss um, potential types of management and what are the pros and cons um, given their knowledge. 
and our knowledge. And, and those two things are, are wildly different. Um, so I think part of the issue is what kind of stakeholder involvement is it? Is it truly participatory or is it just, oh, you can tell us some things? So yeah, I think that's, the, that's part of the issue. Thank you, Trish. Brice? Yes, uh, it is just a very quick comment uh, following the question of uh, Madeleine, I think uh, we heard previously. I think that uh, it failed to, to incorporate a human dimension. Um, I, I think it failed because um, this is not only a question of uh, data availability, uh, I think this is much more a question of power uh, behind this. And uh, this question of power is not taken as it is in the discussions. And uh, I think the very question we have to raise, maybe to foster this, is whose data counts, who qualify the data, who is shaping the problem we are facing. I think these are the, the, the real question, in fact. Um, I agree with you. <laughs> Thank you, please. Uh, do we have another question? Hi. Yeah. Hi. My name is Chelsea Bowler, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Marine Institute, and I also work with WWF Canada. Um, and Brice might have just answered my question a little bit, but um, just kind of a follow up on the discussion. Something I've been thinking about a lot over the last couple of days um, is this idea of power. And it's great to say we need more fisher knowledge, we need more local knowledge, we need more Indigenous knowledge. And it's great when we actually bring all these people to the table, but then what? And, and my context that I'm thinking from is is a stock assessment perspective, right? So again, stock assessment, just in that language that we're using, what does that mean um, here in Atlantic Canada? Um, but then what is done with that knowledge? So, you know, knowledge isn't power, but applied knowledge is power. So if we get all of this knowledge all together, that gives us a more inclusive picture, but then it's still the same people making the same decisions in the same way. Um, that doesn't really give us any more value. So I guess my question, um, my question is, I guess, how do these historically uninclusive systems like a stock assessment process for example, actually foster not only the inclusion of this, these various ways of knowing, but actually applying this knowledge to decision making. So again, kind of this language around consultation versus actual co-decision making. So I know it's a really big question and maybe you guys don't have a, a specific answer, but I'd love to just continue that discussion. In that if somebody has the answer, please tell, tell us, us all. Tell us all. <laughs> Anyone. Um, I'll start with our panelists. Does anybody want to take a stab at that? Well, now you make it so intimidating. No. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think it starts as if they're at the table and they're part or we're part of the decision making, then a decision, if you're working together, a decision should kind of be made collectively. Um, everybody should be in the same room and a decision shouldn't be made until we're all in agreement, or at least for the most part in agreement. And I don't know. I feel like if we're all at the table, we should all have a say. And then that outcome, we kind of should all be happy with it if we're all included. It's all about inclusivity and um, letting people say what they have to say. Please. I just want to build on that um, kind of what Erica was saying. Um, I previously worked for a First Nations organization, and I think that first part comes with bringing everybody to the table. Like that's the first step in including those different knowledge systems and also having people advocating for bringing more people to the table. Um, I can give an example um, when like action plans for species at risk came out, um, like the North Atlantic right whale one, for example. I read through all these action points and there was nothing there about inclusion of that First Nations knowledge or First Nations experiences and that way of knowing. And, you know, I, I flagged that as something, you know, this needs to be included. You need to bring these people to the table. There needs to be more inclusion. And so, you know, those documents take years to prepare. And so when they came out with the next action plan, there were those points then in there that said, you know, we need to include that First Nations knowledge, we need that perspective, and that was great, but then it's great that it's in that documentation, but that's just the first step. The next step needs to come with, okay, 
it's in there now how what what's the next step so you know it's first of all bringing everybody to the table getting it included and then actually having that action i mean that's not a full answer that's just kind of one example but i think it kind of you have to take that first step to make sure if you have those meetings who are you inviting not just academia not just local just kind of bringing everybody to the table i think we uh Evan's looking at me. I can't read his mind. I, <laughs> I, I'd love to hear other people build on that. Is there? A, oh, here we go. Please. So in our small fishery, um, we have had lots of things happen to us. Um, we have the third largest Bruce or a nuclear plant in our fishery um, that we had no say in at all. Uh, and now we're being asked to come up with ideas on how to fix this, um, mm -hmm. you know, which is <laughs> kind of, so now they're asking us to consider a DGR in our, in our territory. What's that? Just It's a deep, a deep geological repository okay. to store all of the nuclear waste that has been created by the nuclear plant, um, as well as now also in our fishing area, um, we're being um, tasked with deciding on whether we will allow a pumped storage project happen. Um, TC Energy is in our territory wanting to do this clean energy project, but, you know, we just, it's so new and they're calling it clean, you know, um, our fisheries group, they do a great job at um, collecting the data and uh, doing the um, research and uh, our environment office, they're doing a great job. We are being allowed into the uh, proposed area for enable to enable to us to do our own uh, research and uh, but we'll see like um, it's always always good to say everybody's consulted but you know does money talk you know because these are really big organizations and we are a very small territory so um, yeah it's good to hear that consultation is taking place. Um, I did say earlier that, you know, it's good to see that, you know, all of the fisheries are having the same issues, but I feel like our small uh, fishery is always tasked with way more than a lot of fisheries because we're like the, the area is so small mm. and uh, these projects, um, actually warm the water so we don't know what that's going to how that's going to affect so you know so Tyler I was you know just wondering if you have any advice or you know on how to how to even go about making these crazy decisions that we have to make yeah um, maybe I'll speak to that point in a couple of the previous points as well in terms of you know, how do we incorporate this social indigenous knowledge into the decision making process? And I think that is the challenge for maybe this community. You know, it, there is a lot of speak and talk and dialogue and DFO documents and NOAA documents of trying to do the process this way. But it is challenging to incorporate this information in ways that hasn't really been done before or isn't the commonplace. Uh, there's a lot of institutional inertia in terms of doing things in the way that they have been done. We see this from the ecosystem perspective as well, you know, trying to bring ecosystem information into the single species world. We're trying to develop these new methods where we're able to do so, but, you know, there is sort of um, a, a tendency of DFO to continue to do things the way that they have. And I, I take their point as well, you know, industry doesn't like things to change a lot quickly. They want, you know, a process that is relatively stable that they can understand what the process will be. Um, so I think these are some of the, the challenges for the research community in terms of coming up with ways of, of, of doing so. And in terms of uh, the example that you provided, if the, if the water is going to be warmed, um, 
perhaps we look at it from like an ecological perspective of what you might expect for you know the different species that are being fished, how they're going to respond to warming waters, what that will mean for the people in the area, and um, and then yeah, trying to take this into consideration in the process. But um, I don't I don't think it's a an, an easy solution and i think this is really the work of of this community to try to figure out how to do that um i also just want to say like hold your head up high um i i hear it in your voice the the trouble that um this brought to you and probably so much stress and uh i just want to simply say like persevere and you know you know um your culture and what you stand for so um that will that will hold strong and it'll it'll prove results, I'm sure. So I hear not just questions of power, but history and distrust and that run deep and are difficult. Uh, we have another question, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm uh, Keith Sullivan, uh, president with the uh, Fish Food and Allied Workers Union here in Newfoundland and Labrador, so representing a small scale harvesters and many people work on shore and the processing uh, plants. And uh, I, I guess generally most of the people, and when I was fishing and when others like Tony, you'd be uh, fishing a number of different species, multi-species, small amounts of crab, cod, lobster. And I think most people thought about things in the way of uh, the ecosystem health overall in the balance. And it makes sense to get get back to that. I think everyone recognizes it, but uh, it seems ironically uh, that as we do that, it seems like harvester knowledge, indigenous knowledge seems to be excluded more because it is a incredibly complex. I kind of understand why, but uh, even over uh, my career in, uh, in, in the fishery, I think we saw the impacts of the cod moratorium and some harvesters recognized the problems before, before others, inshore harvesters. But even since then, uh, we seem to make some gains, but now I think going back so much so where the DFO stock assessments used to have a part for uh, stakeholder input and knowledge. That was something where it wasn't covered off in the assessment, it was included and we were able to make those points. That was excluded. So more and more, I guess the consultation happens, there's a box ticked and you talk to groups, but really getting that knowledge incorporated uh, from, from harvesters or indigenous groups seems to be more difficult now, even though we're trying to improve things for conservation. I don't know if any of the panelists got any ideas of how successful uh, they've been in you know, officially getting your, your, your knowledge and input included into uh, you know, the management and science processes. Trish, I see your hand up. Would you like to, um, to speak to this? Um, yes, I was actually speaking, I think, to the, the previous comment, but it applies somewhat in general. And that is, you know, we've talked about coordinating like between the fishery management agencies and the stakeholders. But then there's this whole other level of, you know, nuclear plants, wind energy, things that are governed by different federal agencies or state agencies. And that creates this whole additional layer of coordination that is often not done very well. Um, I know we have so much wind energy coming in on the East Coast, and there's been a lot of work to try to coordinate with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management who handles the placement of wind farms. Um, and it hasn't always gone as smoothly as you know anyone would like either us or BOEM, but, or the stakeholders, but um, it does just become exponentially more confusing and more difficult once you add in multiple different agencies, as well as multiple types of stakeholders. And you can see where sometimes it, it becomes difficult to get it done right, but that doesn't mean we, don't know, we should stop trying. Evan, are we at time? Or do we have time for another question or? Oh, we do. Oh, good. Uh, oh, good. 
please go. Who's next? Okay, I'm, I'm next. Uh, Kevin Scribner from the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And I offer you a, an ex, a, to pay attention to an experiment going on, on there with uh, management of salmon in the Columbia, Columbia River Basin, which cumulatively is about the size of France. So um, in 2020, uh, I had the joy of uh, being on a completing a three year um, uh, federal advisory committee that was convened by NOAA Fisheries, the Western Division of NOAA Fisheries. And it was a recognition by the lead managers, NOAA, that they couldn't by themselves figure out a, develop a recovery plan for the 24 sound mounted stocks in the Columbia River Basin. So they went forward and NOAA Fisheries and got established a federal advisory committee of stakeholders to convene together. After three years, and you know, the part of the joy of that, when I looked around the table at who was there, every stakeholder group that should be represented was represented. Wow. And um, and Noah, I, I, I paid him to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you should bow to Barry Tom, who is you know head of the Western Division at the time for Noah. He came in with this is our process, not my process, not Noah's process. So the experiment goes on. After three years, we developed a framework of goals for recovery of every salmonid species, of every tributary. Of, you know, all, all the, the stakeholder group was supported by about 200 scientists. Um, and then, but we, what we realized, the target audience that was really, really important was Congress, was the politicians because they control the purse strings to be able to make change happen, as well as they can change the regulation and the rules and regulation to make change happen. So now the experiment goes on because the four state governors um, actually said, we will host the next iteration of this. And so we now have the Columbia Basin Collaborative, which is gonna go on. The experiment is, can we be big, big bold and wise? So pay attention. Excellent, thank you. Some good news. Peter Holme, uh, I listened to Patricia talk about the stock assessment that showed one eel, and that was gonna go into the scientific report, which leads me to the point that 72% of all statistics are made up right on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so my name is Ken Paul. I'm with the uh, Wildestuque Nation. It's interesting to hear the talk about, um, I guess, lack of stakeholder engagement, problems with that. And uh, did we make all the DFO people stand up? Yeah. I just, <laughs> just, okay, just kidding. Um, so I do have a question. It's a little bit different um, on a different track, but it's for, these, for all the panelists. Um, right now, there's a lot of investment going into uh, technology and automation including the fisheries. Um, artificial intelligence is a big part of that. Um, I know that when you get into processing and things like that, if you're doing a job by hand, probably in about 20 years, it's gonna be done by a robot. And I wanted to know from what you guys have experienced and learned, what you think that impact is gonna have on small scale fisheries, coastal communities, and all of this empowerment that we're all trying to fight for. Can I just ask, could, uh, can you give an example or two of what types of technologies you're talking about? You said the possibility of um, transferring to robots doing people's work. Anything else as you see technology changing in the fishery? Well, with the proliferation of uh, global positioning systems and all these other things, there's even talk about sending out fishing boats without people. I know they're talking about automating, automating um, oil rigs. So you don't have people on there and they're saying, well, it's a safety thing. So you don't have to have like um, 50 people on an oil rig during a storm where it's dangerous. You'll just have robots out there and they'll still be able to continue to pump the oil. But, you know, in my mind is, okay, well, if they're going to start making these uh, investments in larger scale industrial things, eventually it's going to start showing up in some of these manual type uh, industries such as fisheries. And if they start automating fishing boats, like what's that going to do to our communities and, and fisheries management in general, but I'm just more interested in what they, what people think about the communities. 
Um, I mean, I don't know if I'm biased, but like as a fisher, I hope not. Like, <laughs> what will I do? Um, but essentially, I feel like that just shows that we need to protect, I'll just say for me, like small scale fisheries. Um, I just, I think that's really important to, to hold on to what we're doing. And we can't, I don't know, we just, we can't bring everything automated into the world. I think that leaves a lot of, I'd say room for error, even though they're supposed to be perfect, but robots are, aren't perfect, neither are humans. But I don't know if that's gonna answer your question, but I don't like that, that technology thing. I don't know, and I'm a millennial. I, like. I can't resist that, you know? <laughs> yeah. How about you, Tyler? Do you wanna to speak to that or, or anyone on the phone? Oh, here we go, Trish is raising her hand. Uh, yes, I'll also say Bryce is raising his hand. So oh, I didn't see that. He, he can go after me. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, um, well, you know, it's hard to say, obviously, but, you know, one possibility is that, you know, some of the really large scale harvest, especially, you know, in international waters and things like that may go completely um, you know, robotic or, or some, something that does not involve humans. But I feel like there will always be room for um, at least a small scale fishery, which may require some change on the part of, you know, certain fleets are definitely very large scale. And, you know, and depending on the type of fishery, it may have to have a certain level of uh, large scale in order to actually work um, because you have to go out to certain uh, areas that are rougher weather and small boats can't get to. But, you know, we've already seen the development of things like community supported fisheries and other types of direct marketing. And I think if nothing else, some of that kind of niche specialty fishing, you know, could account for a fairly large portion of at least small scale fishing and certain specific types of fishing that um, are for things like scallops or that people are really highly regarded. And so then you, you want to be able to say, oh, it's so high quality, it's caught by hand. And so it may require some marketing, but I, I think that fishing by people will not disappear. Thank you, Trish. Brice, s'il vous plaît. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, just to answer the last question, I think that uh, I will distinguish two kinds of uh, changes. First, there are changes on the fishing practices uh, due to uh, technology. And second is um, the changes on uh, our knowledge uh, on fisheries. Um, like monitoring and, and stuff like that. Um, I think that uh, regarding these two uh, kind of changes, uh, technology uh, already have a lot of uh, effects on the way people fish and on the way we are uh, documenting fisheries. But I would say that uh, technologies uh, are not good or bad in itself. Um, I, I think that uh, some, some good things uh, could, uh, could come from technology as well. And um, if you look at, uh, for instance, uh, data activism or uh, counter mapping experiences, a lot of them, and probably a growing number of such experiences are uh, allowed by um, the increase of technology. So I think we should consider this and maybe it will change the relation of power again. Maybe it's an, an, an interesting way to observe this. That sounds like it's something worth digging into at a future conference, honestly, is like the role of technology in support of small scale fishing. Um, do we have uh, additional questions? I see. Oh. I'll speak to that point just briefly if right here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just before we change oh. gears uh, from the technology. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so that's a great point. And if you look historically from fisheries, basically you need to assume technology and fishing power and fishing effort, you know, from the beginning of the, the 18th century in order to understand how we've expanded globally. So typically, you know, you factor into account 2% per year improvement in fishing technology. And that could come into, you know, through engine power after the, the age of uh, sail or through fish finders or these types of things. So we've been, you know, working with technology historically, and then, you know, future technologies will obviously manifest uh, as time goes on. But I think, you know, the romantic in me growing up in, uh, you know, small scale fishing community, I think there'll always be a place for that interaction with the fishermen, you know, getting your catch off the dock, um, the practices that we've seen, you know, with these traditional weirs that have been used for, for a long time. So uh, I'm not as pessimistic maybe about uh, robots doing all of our fishing for us. <laughs> so interesting to me that not only the people in the room who come from fish, the fishermen in the room, the fisher folk in the room, but so many scientists also grew up or were inspired by, this isn't an abstract connection. It's not like we're just here by accident. I have, you know, similar stories and I bet a lot of people here do. We're not just, you know, in so many cases, we're not just academics and federal employees and things like that. We also have really deep connections and passionate um, feelings about, about uh, fisheries and small scale fisheries. Hi, uh Sorry, I stole the microphone from Sarah because she had a question, but I just wanted to make a really quick comment about the technology just to give an example where artificial intelligence is being used right now to help support Indigenous communities. Um, so one of the projects that uh, I'm working on, uh, look, we're working with academics, um, Inuit, the Inuit community of Santa Kilowak and uh, a private contractor as well. And we're actually looking at developing a model um, through our private contractor using the data that our academic partner is collecting um, to better ID um, sea cucumbers um, and where those regions might be where habitat is supporting sea cucumbers to help develop a fishery in the region for, for that community and the community will have full ownership over that. So that's just a positive example of technology that's being used. I'm gonna pass it to Sarah because she's been waiting a long time. <laughs> Thank you, thanks for that comment. Hi everyone, Sarah Harper from the University of Victoria. So this is actually not a question, it's more of a comment from the previous thread, so a bit off topic, but relates um, to this last point, but um, it's more of a bright spot from the Pacific region. Um, coming from Haida Gwaii, I've worked a little bit with the Haida Nation, and I don't speak on behalf of the Haida Nation, but um, I have learned a lot from them. And um, it's really on that topic of power sharing, and um, there's this wonderful agreement called the Guayanas Agreement, which was many years in the making, and it's a co-management agreement between the Council of the Haida Nation and the Government of Canada, and initially it included Parks Canada and now includes DFO. And um, the, the whole reason why the, the, the document was signed because um, the people at the table agreed to disagree and they found their points of agreement and, and they were fine with that they weren't all in alignment. And I think it's a really neat example. And now there's two people from each of the representation of government sitting at the table and they have to come to a consensus agreement on issues and um, not that this particular example can be scaled to everywhere but I think it's nice to see that that struggle can lead to these power sharing agreements where there is really equal voices at the table so just wanted to share that. Great to hear all these examples of uh, positive power sharing. Um, do we have a uh... A mic in the back and the checkered shirt. Oh, here we go. Oh. Hi, I'm Sarah Schaffler. I'm with NOAA Fisheries, the same agency that Patricia here and Trish online are from. And um, thank you for bringing the conversation back to that. Um, and you kind of started answering my question as Kevin did as well. Um, I, I have, a, I guess, a comment and then, and then a question, a couple comments. So in the States, we have these regional council system and they are a type of co-management um, on the councils, uh, some of them, and in the, including in the Pacific, the one I'm the most familiar with, we have tribal representative and industry representatives on the council itself. We also have advisory bodies that consist of industry representatives, NGOs, um, and others. Um, and that, um, that's not a perfect system because uh, like here, I don't know, can I get a raise of hands how many fisher folk were able to make it here? I'm not fisher folk, so I'm not raising my hand. 
So uh, that's not many. So to my point that um, it's expensive, it's time consuming to get to these meetings and to participate in them. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we try to make it as easy as possible and certainly COVID helped level the playing field a little bit, I think helped increase participation and make it a lot easier for folks because all of our meetings went online for two years or, or over two years. Um, in the agency, we also have, um, we have a document that I just recently learned about. It's, um, it's guidance for incorporating traditional ecological knowledge into decision-making in the agency for NOAA fisheries and for the National Ocean Service. Um, I don't think too many people are familiar with that, but it, we, we do have that guidance. So there, it is out there and it is um, encouraged to, to do so. So there are options. We, a couple other examples we have of participation. We have cooperative research. We have funding in the agency for cooperative research between agency scientists and um, people with local knowledge. For example, we worked with local fishermen to um, evaluate the recovery of ground fish in the Southern California region. And their information was really important to that effort. Um, and a couple of those stocks were found to be recovered, I don't know, 20 years sooner than, than expected in part because of the, the, the knowledge that we got from locals on that. So my question is, um, you know, what are other examples of participation particularly in Canada, because I know there's a lot of folks from Canada here and I'm not familiar with that. And then what are what are other ways that we can overcome some of the challenges to participation? And I'm not saying that participation is, is a perfect system. Um, I come from the science side of things. I worked with stock assessment scientists for the past 15 years. And our perspective is a lot of times when science is considered, it's not necessarily used in a decision either. Um, but you know, for the challenges for participation for locals, um, fisher folk and indigenous folks, what are what are other examples of participation and, and ways of overcoming some of the challenges that you have for participating? Um, so I would say for my perspective is like, I took three days off work, like this is the middle of my season to come here. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to do that. And I'm leaving tomorrow morning though, because I. I don't want to take off more time. Um, so I know not every fish, everybody has the same fishing season, but a collaborative maybe effort on dates, maybe there is one, um, I don't know, but a collaborative effort on dates, that could be one. Um, and more awareness to events kind of like these. Uh, I was approached to come speak here, otherwise I wouldn't have known. Um, that might be on me also, I'm not sure, but it could go two ways. Um, more awareness being brought to communities and uh, local fishers and stuff like that. And yeah, I think that's another, like a, a big one we do come with is basically the timing of a lot of these events. They are right in the middle of our seasons and that is challenging, but I, I understand we also have to accommodate for a hundred other people um, but it's just something to think about. Anyone on the phone that would like to uh, speak to that? Okay. Um, I have one, one remark to make. Will small scale fishermen be around 50 years from now? Only if the community supports them and wants them. On their own, they can't make it. So, so you're saying, are they gonna be replaced by these things? Uh, I've been to Puerto Rico 40, 50 years ago. The sugar cane was cut by hand. They could go to machinery and they did not because it would put thousands of, of uh, cutters out of work. In Chile, they chased the, uh, the farmers off the land onto the ocean. And now they're going to try to chase them off the ocean. Where do they go now? So it's a social thing that will be solved by, by the people and by the governments. You can't rely on the fishermen to solve that. Uh, we want to be here 50 years from now but it's up to the people whether, whether they want us here, whether they want our fish and they want our stories. Thank you for that. I see uh, two hands. Oh, there we yeah. go, Sonia. Hi, yeah, Sonia Strobel. Um, I just wanna reiterate what Erica had to say there about um, why there aren't more fishers at these conferences. And I know that none of our fishers are here because they're all fishing. And this is, was really hard. I mean, I really try to encourage folks to come to things like this, but they always happen to fall right in the 
height of the fishing season. And so it's, not, it's not really possible. So I don't, I don't know if there's any consultation or consideration of fisher schedules. And the other thing is that, um, you know, the, the costs, you know, I, I have a, a business, I can afford to um, dedicate some money to come here, but our harvesters can't to, to fly to Newfoundland. So, I mean, I think if we want to have harvester voices in the room, we do have to consider things like, um, you know, bursaries and scholarships, travel support to help get people here. I also wanted to give an example of uh, in British Columbia, multi-stakeholder kind of conversations, but what uh, Kevin was talking about, uh, I was recently attended a uh, group, the Marine Area Planning Process, I think um, Rachel was there as well, a few people from British Columbia were there, and I was kind of inspired because, you know, uh, the province of British Columbia was really stepping into a, an active role with First Nations to consider how we uh, plan for use of marine areas, and uh, there were harvesters definitely in the room, and uh, I was in Campbell River, and they also had done some work to consult with harvesters how to get them in the room and how to fund their travel. And I thought that that was a very successful example of getting people together in the room so it can be done. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Johan Johansson with the FFAW here in St. John's. I do believe it's a fair comment to ask the question about who is actually a harvester, but uh, looking at the hands that went up, we can rephrase that question and say, who is here on behalf of harvesters as opposed to governance or as opposed to academia? So if we could try that one, I think you're gonna see a few more hands, but that is fine because that means that within the harvesting sector, there is some capacity partic to participate for the whole as opposed to on the individuals. When it comes to the, um, conservation and um, managing conservation from the top down. Uh, the challenge is that it goes back to the question, conserving what, for whom, and where. If you just apply a conservation space without an evaluation of its success, what does it matter? The environment is going to change. What, what is going to happen is that you are going to have a immediate direct impact on those who rely on what is in the water. You are gonna exclude them from access without measuring the success of what you're trying to conserve. Um, and that is a real challenge because species abundance and ecosystem system complexity changes as much as we think that it remains static it changes with the environment. What Tony fished 40 years ago and what he fishes today is miles apart, but he is still sustaining a livelihood in the fishery. So there has to be a full context when we are trying to understand these things, as opposed to, uh, as um, Tyler said, you're starting with a single species. And even if you go up to the ecosystem, level uh, where the full complexity is evaluated or protected. But if you don't account for the ecosystem changing in and of itself, everything is for naught. Because if you conserve something here and the environment changing, what you try to conserve here may no longer be there no matter what you do. And it's, well, in Newfoundland, the discussion is managing one species, conserving one species to the detriment of another. If the ecosystem and the environment has changed, it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, we can see lobster and codfish disappeared locally, but you've seen them blossom in the Gulf of Maine 30 years ago. Lobster did really well in Gulf of Maine and Southwest Nova, but the environment has changed. Gulf of Maine doesn't see the same lobster fishery now, but we, on the south coast of Newfoundland, you've seen a blossoming of it. Everything changes, no matter how much we think it remains the same. So just a couple of comments on, on what that means and the information from people who actually uh, live and fish, they will see this on the water, right? That just, just perspective. I might be exaggerating some context, <laughs> but that's fine. It's just for the illustration. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everyone for, for your engagement and very much many thanks to our presenters for the time that they've taken and the wisdom that they've brought. We really appreciate it. And there's so much more to talk about and so much more to think about. And I'm looking forward to the next sessions. Thanks. Always have to do a bad job of breaking up good conversation, but guess what? It's lunchtime, and that's when we can continue with the discussion. So see if you can think of where people, how, how we can integrate people in that ecosystem more explicitly so that all those engagement consultation can be meaningful and impactful. Okay, be back here please at 1.45 because we really need to get governance right. Thanks very much everybody.